actually you, you'd, you'd be capturing an IR position. So the bottom of your split squat might look a little different. Good morning, happy Friday. I have no coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, so busy Friday as usual. Gonna dig straight into today's Q&A which uh, is a question uh, from Zach. So Zach is working with some post-op knee patients. They're training the anterior outlet, trying to recapture some constant orientation. So this question took us in a lot of different directions. We covered a lot of grants. So we talked about visual KPIs in the gym. Rather than putting people down on the table and, and doing direct measures of joint ranges of motion, how can we use another activity that would require some representation of internal rotation? and use that as our KPI and use that for comparison purposes. We talked about the influence of, of range of motion. So how deep into a squat clean do you need to go to make sure that you're capturing the pelvic outlet position? Um, what is the influence of the magnitude of load? What is the influence of the rate of load? So we covered a lot of ground here. We talked about some examples of some oscillatory impulses that you could probably use um, to help to restore and recapture this concentric orientation, um, how to develop the overcoming influence as well. So like I said, covered a lot of ground here. This is actually a great question from Zach. So very, very appreciative, Zach. So thank you. Um, everybody have an outstanding weekend. The podcast will be up on Sunday as usual, and I'll see you next week. All right. So my question is going to be like, I guess, confirming like thought process with in like exercise progressions um, and kind of just like knowing like when someone's ready to progress. Um, so context, I've got a few of my post-op ACLs right now. They're all like a similar phase in their rehab um, where I like can teaching them like force absorption at higher velocities, like prior to getting into some plyometrics. Uh -huh. um, most of them are narrow cylinders. Um, so just low force producers. And like anytime, like we are like, the exercise I have in mind um, is like have them on a slant board and then like a kettlebell clean and I'll cue them to like wait for the weight and then drop with it. Like kind of like create it like a water balloon. Um, to like teach that initial yield. Um, <laughs> when they all do it though, they just like, it looks like gravity just like bottoms them out. Like they just like keep going. Yeah. Um, so where I think I want to go with that is like keeping the exercise that they're familiar with. Um, but instead of having them wait for the weight, like have them like really aggressively start to like drop underneath it to what I think would be like teaching like that concentric orientation uh -huh. of the pelvic diaphragm. Uh -huh. I guess where my question is going to go, I, th I find it easier conceptually when the goal is like recapturing range of motion because like you can, it's like a very easy checks and balance. Like, did you get the range of motion or not? Correct. Um, for that type of thing where I'm transitioning from like more of a yielding bias to getting more aggressive with like the concentric orientation, yep. is that strictly visual? Like, did they not bottom out the way they used to, or like there's certain things you're going to be looking at specifically to let me know, like, all right, I was successful in that transition. And then they did that successfully. Okay. So you, you still have range of motion excursions that you can use because they're going to be moving through um, the, the, the middle range of the movement where the pressure is highest, where you have concentric orientation, where you've got shape change of the pelvis. So you can still utilize your, your movement KPIs to help, help guide you and make sure that they're capturing that. Right. From, um, uh, go ahead. Use the movement KPIs from a, like, put them back on the table and measure something or just make sure. Like, yeah, you can do that. Unless you got like a, like a, a, again, if they're up in their dynamic, it's like you might have another, another representation. So, so think about this. If you get a concentric pelvic diaphragm more effectively than you did prior to, what would happen to your split squat? I'd say you wouldn't go, be able to go as deep. Right? Well, well actually you, you'd, you'd be capturing an IR position. So the bottom of your split squat might look a little different in regards to how much control you have, how quickly you can move into and out of it, right? From a dynamic standpoint, right? So when you talk about a visual with the activity itself, so you, you're doing a, like a, the, the squat, you're doing a squat clean, right? Yeah, like by double leg symmetrical. Yeah, it's a kettlebell squat clean. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So, so visually you might see that the turnaround is very, very quick. So from a timing standpoint, you would see that difference, right? They're able to pressurize, they're able to go from eccentric to concentric much more quickly. But an, another way to look at this is like, let's take another activity that, that might be a little bit more complex in regards to the stance. So I'm, I got you in a split stance. I have you do a series of, of split squats Right. And I and I say, OK, from a dynamic standpoint, how quickly can they make the turnaround in that? Right. So they have to lower themselves into the IR position. They have to capture the concept of orientation and then pressurize and push themselves out of that as well. So I can use the relationship, you know, between exercises. So you so cueing the split squat with a little more speed than maybe what we were yeah. to see. Can they make that turnaround or, or don't even tell them anything? and just have them do it. And then you get to be the judge of like, oh, okay. We captured a better representation of iron in the bottom. We saw a stronger turnaround. They usually comment, they go, wow, that was so much easier. That's usually what happens. Gotcha. Right? Um, if, if I may, one of the things that you may wanna consider um, if you're having trouble um, in uh, uh, progressing that is you start them from the, the static representation where they actually have to just hold the position that you're trying to capture and then slowly increase the amplitude above and below, right? So they're doing an impulse literally at that level. And then you expand it. You say, now start here, come down and catch it and come right back up, come down and catch it, come right back up come down and catch it and come right back up. So you just slowly expand the excursion that they're moving without resistance. So the drop, right? And then they have to catch. And so then you're, you're increasing the rate at which they have to perform that progressively. And then doing so, then you get your nice little concentric overcoming where you get the nice stiff connective tissue response that goes along with them capturing the concentric orientation. All right, that, that makes sense. It's just building it from the static end position to just decrease like the momentum that they're coming in with essentially. So it'd be, it'd be, right. it'd be easier to constantly orient against less. Yeah. Yeah. Lower. yeah. You're just, you're, you're, it, all you're doing is just, again, pure progression, but, but again, it's like, you, you don't have to change the magnitude, but you're going to, you're going to change the amplitude of the movement and you're going to change the rate at which they are, they are performing it. Okay. I like that. And then in the past, like when trying to teach this, um, before I kind of like started looking at things through this lens and the model, um, I used to like, I kind of like take like bands over either shoulder. Um, so it's like, again, probably increase the rate, almost thinking like, all right, well, if I increase it beyond what gravity is normally, then maybe like once we put them back in just like a gravity environment without the bands, it'll be easier for them to resist that. Um, so now what I'm thinking, is yes, I'm probably going to increase the rate, which maybe they're not ready for. Um, but I'm also starting to think like how the guts might play into that. Um, and I guess I have conflicting thought processes on the guts, like why it might make it easier or tougher. Um, so I guess the momentum of the guts is going to, actually, I guess the momentum of the guts is going to make that tougher because it's going to, it's going to increase the rate on it once it catches up. Yeah. Build out diaphragm. It's two hits, so to speak, right? So they drop. The bands pull them down faster than they would drop, right? Yep. And the guts are floating. So they go down, they stop, they have to capture that position, and then the guts come down second. So would you ever use, like, it's going to make it harder to capture the concentric orientation against that second hit, but it almost seems like it might make getting like the, the eccentric, like the yield easier. There you go. That's it. That's exactly right. That's so exactly if can, right. If, if, from like a, just like a local knee tolerance, like in the case of an ACL again, if they could handle the rate and the momentum going down, could that almost be like a regression initially in terms of like just capturing the bottom position take the bands away as I'm initially trying to capture the concentric and I could add the bands in when I want them to limit the range of motion again. Okay. So yeah, you're going to, have to you're going to have to play with magnitude here though, because 
again, you're it, it, and not it the dance initially is going to make that tougher too. Yeah, so so you have to just consider the the tissue tolerances and things like that, especially with the ACL coming back. Gotcha. All right. For your premise, like I don't disagree with your premise. Yeah, it's just it, does it actually pan out from a magnitude standpoint? All right, and then strength That's training. Yeah, for sure. Just like supplementary strength training, these are like would be like the tap and go variations for like squats, in terms of just like maintain it as they're going down and up throughout the range. Yeah, if you're trying to you're trying to hang on to concentric orientation. Correct. Yeah, to try to try to supplement the goal of helping them not bottom out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, so, and then, so watch your depth as well, because again, you don't want, you don't want to, like this, this is where um, the excursion matters as well. Right. So this would not be somebody that you would, you would put on an incline board and say, sit all the way down into your deep squat. Right. Because that would be eccentric orientation. If you're trying to teach them to maintain the, the concentrically oriented outlet. So I have been putting them on the decline board still just because like it, it helps them maintain like a better looking squat from whatever subjective I'm defining that as. Right. Um, but I'm not, I'm limiting the depth. That's, that's what I'm saying. Right. That's, that's what I'm saying is like, is like you just have to, you have to monitor that excursion. Yeah. Cause you don't, you don't want to, again, if it, at some point in time, they should be able to do all of that stuff for you, right? But if you're if you're really focused in on on trying to maintain the concentric outlet, then train the concentric outlet and be consistent with that until they can they can demonstrate it at will. Gotcha. Right? All right. Thank you. Yeah, that's good.